So welcome, everyone. Can you hear me OK? Great. Um, my name is Steve Weitzman, and I'm here in my role as director of the Herbert D. Katz Center for Advanced Judaic Studies. I have the honor of introducing our wonderful speaker this afternoon. But before I do so, allow me to make um, one practical announcement and um, also say a few words of thank you. Uh, my practical announcement is to ask you to silence or extinguish your cell phones so those don't go off in the middle of the talk. Um, I also want to note that after the talk itself, we'll have a brief period of time for questions. And what we will do is circulate um, microphones. So if you have a question at that point, just raise your hand and somebody will come to you with a microphone. And that will allow us, uh, both the speaker to hear you, but also allow us to record your questions. Um, tonight's lecture launches uh, a new initiative that has been made possible by a generous grant from the Josephine Cohen Foundation. Our mission at the Katz Center is to foster new research about the Jewish people and its history and culture, using each year of our fellowship program to focus on a different theme. And this year, we've been focused on Jews and their understanding of nature, a topic that has taken us into the frontier zone between the history of science and mysticism, among other fascinating areas. The Josephine Cohen Foundation has given us a chance to share some of this intellectual adventure with a broader circle of people. And I want to begin by expressing my thanks uh, to the foundation um, and to the Cohen family, and especially to, to Walter Cohen, who is with us here this afternoon. Um, they've given us a chance to honor the memory of Josie Cohen um, in a way that uh, shares the riches of Jewish studies scholarship with the public, and we're very grateful for that. I also want to thank two co-sponsors of tonight's lecture uh, for their help in making uh, this evening possible. Um, first of all, the Jewish Studies Program, directed by Catherine Hellerstein, as well as the Philosophy Department, chaired by Michael Weisberg. And we thank Michael and Catherine for their support. And lastly, but not least, of course, I want to thank um, a member of the Katz Center staff, Dr. Ann Albert, who is the Director of Public Programs for the Katz Center, who has ver worked very hard to make tonight's program a reality. So thank you, Anne. The writing of our speaker tonight, Rebecca Goldstein, is populated by people at the height of their reasoning power, philosophers and scientists who are trying to see the world in a new and clearer way. Their aspiration mirrors that of Dr. Goldstein herself, a Princeton-trained philosopher whose work allows her readers into some of the deepest mysteries of time, space, mathematics, and God. What distinguishes her writing, however, isn't simply the powerful mind at work, but the ways in which that mind registers truths about itself that reason alone cannot fully encompass. Truths that emerge from being in a body, and feeling desire and pain, the lessons that only the experience of love and being a parent can teach, and the insights that faith and tradition can sometimes yield. As I read them, um, Dr. Goldstein's novels, works like The Mind-Body Problem, Properties of Light, A Novel of Love, Betrayal, and Quantum Physics, 36 Arguments for the Existence of God, among other works, reveals a kind of intellectual kinship with the philosopher-mathematician Kurt Godel, a subject of one of Dr. Goldberg's nonfiction books. Now, some of you might know that Godel was a mathemat mathematical genius associated with irresolvable logical paradoxes. He also happened to be a close friend with Einstein, one of the subjects of tonight's talk. Godel's incomplete, uh, incomplete, incompleteness theorem showed that within any system of reason, there are always truths that can never be proven from within that system, that there is always something incomplete and inconsistent and inadequate about reasoning in its most purified form. For me, at least, Goldstein's fiction demonstrates something like that is true of the mind itself. It can never fully generate the truth on its own, seems prone to self-contradiction and even to self-betrayal, and is never complete or self-contained, always ultimately finding itself dependent on something beyond itself. Dr. Goldstein's double ability to reason and to think beyond the limits of reason is, I imagine, one of the reasons her writing has garnered the highest honors academic culture can bestow, including a MacArthur Grant, election to the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, and a National Humanities Medal conferred by President Obama, among many, many other accolades. 
I think this is actually somewhat ironic because a good portion of our fiction is actually about the insufficiency of academia, the way in which folly or self-delusion can get in the way of the scholarly search for truth. But academia got it right, this time at least, uh, by recognizing her talent and her insight. And I'm thrilled that we get a chance to learn directly from her now. So without further ado, please join me in welcoming Dr. Thank you. That was a, an extraordinarily gracious um, introduction. I really thank you for it, and I hope I'm not going to disappoint you too much by now speaking. Um, but I want to make this evening um, three audacious claims, um, three bold claims, and they are so audacious and so bold that I'm afraid I'm not going to be able to argumentatively do justice to all three of them. Maybe two, maybe one and a half. We'll see. We'll see how it goes. Um, so let me first just put forth uh, these claims. And um, even though without my explicating them, they're probably going to be um, somewhat unintelligible. So the first uh, concerns the audacity of Einstein's physics, uh, both his special theory of relativity and especially his general theory of relativity. My, my entry into philosophy was by way of physics, um, and, uh, and I've always kept my interest in that. Um, the claim is that, that I want to put forth is that this audacity and the confidence um, behind this audacity derived not from the empirical evidence that Einstein had available to him, uh, because in fact he had very little uh, evidence, uh, empirical evidence. Uh, that's part of the audacity. Uh, it derived not so much from considerations of physics, uh, but rather from metaphysics. Uh, very large views about the nature of reality. Um, and a specific metaphysical intuition that I want to talk about, about the hidden nature of reality, which I'm going to call the saturation principle for reasons that will hopefully become obvious. The second large claim, audacious claim, I want to make is that in his deep commitment to the saturation principle, Einstein felt a profound affinity with the 17th century uber-rationalists, and I mean rationalists in the way that philosophers mean rationalists, anti-empiricist um, philosopher Baruch Spinoza, 17th century Baruch Spinoza, and that this affinity partly explains the reverence and, in fact, the love that Einstein expressed for Spinoza, choosing love's favored chosen medium for expressing itself, a love poem. Um, people always think I'm being metaphorical when I talk about Einstein's love poem to Spinoza, I'm not being metaphorical. There's the proof. Uh, Zu Spinoza's Ethik uh, is the name of this poem. Um, there are five stanzas. Um, and you can actually see he crossed out a lot. He labored over this poem. Um, there are five stanzas. I'm just going to read, um, I think, the first, maybe the second. Um, do, do forgive my not very good German accent. Wie blieb ich diesen edlen Mann mehr als ich mit Wörtern sagen kann? Doch fürcht ich, dass er bleibt allein mit seinen strahlenden heiligen Schein. How much do I love this noble man? More than I could say with words. I fear, though, he'll remain alone with a holy halo of his own. I'm going to skip to the last Verse, bear with the tortured German. Du denkst sein Beispiel, zeiget uns eben, 
was diese Lehren dem Menschen kann geben, wir trauen nicht den tröstlichen Schein, zum Erhabenen muss man geboren sein. You think his example would show us what this teaching can give humankind, trust not the comforting facade, one must be born sublime. And this, it's a airless, it's, it's genuine love poem. He also in um, 1920 uh, made a pilgrimage to Spinoza's model, modest little house in The Hague. There is his signature, the six one down. Uh, right, see it, A. Einstein. Um, what would inspire such devotion, reverence, love? Um, it was not only their having shared the same metaphysical intuition, the saturation principle, I'm going to argue, um, but the sweeping implications, ethical and spiritual, that Spinoza drew from it. I think that's what swept, uh, so to speak, Einstein off his feet, or so I shall boldly claim. Um, the second, or is no, I think I'm up to the third bold claim. Yeah, the third bold claim. Yeah, we had the audacity of like, yeah. Okay, the third bold claim um, I'd like to make concerns Spinoza and his audacity. And I'm not talking so much here about whatever it was that got him uh, put into harem, uh, the Jewish form of, of excommunication, um, at the tender age of 24, before he had even published anything, um, I've got my audacious views about what lay behind uh, the harem, the most severe harem uh, that the Amsterdam Portuguese uh, community ever issued. Um, but that's not what I'm going to be talking about tonight. Rather, I want to talk about his philosophical audacity of what was eventually published posthumously uh, in his magnum opus called The Ethics. Um, nothing quite like his system had ever been attempted. And he was in so many ways completely out of sync with the philosophical tenor of his time. Ah, oh, you're thinking, no he wasn't. What about Descartes? What about Rene Descartes, his slightly older uh, rationalist predecessor um, wasn't Spinoza following in the footsteps of Descartes, only going further, being more of a rationalist extremist, making more claims than Descartes had made for pure reason? Um, actually, I think not. Um, I think, in fact, that the source of Spinoza's rationalism, his metaphysical intuition laying down what he took as the requirements for existence is entirely different from the source of Descartes' rationalism, which isn't metaphysical at all, but rather epistemological, having to do with the requirements uh, that Descartes thought uh, were needed in order for something to count, for a belief to count as knowledge, indubitability. Uh, one was an epistemological requirement, Descartes. Spinoza's is entirely different. Uh, it's a metaphysical intuition. Um, and uh, I'm going to claim, this is a really audacious claim, uh, that uh, this metaphysical intuition uh, came from uh, the kind of discussions that were very current in the Jewish Spinoza, um, Jewish Spinoza, the Jewish Amsterdam of Spinoza's day, uh, Kabbalah. Um, I actually, there, there's been a lot of, starting with um, Wolfson, uh, there's been a lot of attempts to try to connect Spinoza up with traditional Jewish uh, texts, usually concentrating on um, uh, Maimonides, um, perhaps because he's considered the most prominent of traditionally Jewish philosophers. But I've always found such attempts quite forced um, and even worse, uh, distorting the ideas of Spinoza, the basic intuitions uh, of Spinoza. 
Spinoza himself uh, condemned Maimonides' uh, approach to philosophy in the most vehement terms in his Tractatus Theologico Politicus. Um, Therefore, the method of Maimonides is clearly useless, to which we may add that it does away with all the certainty which the masses acquire by careful reading of scripture or which is gained by any other persons in any other way. In conclusion, then, we dismiss Maimonides as harmful, useless, and absurd. Um, it's from chapter 9. There are, other, there are other places as well. So I've always uh, taken... Spinoza at his word here. Um, Maimonides had tried to reconcile Judaism with what was considered in his time to be the best philosophical slash scientific thinking, which was Aristotle uh, at that time, which was he, Aristotle was simply dubbed the philosopher in the late Middle Ages. Uh, but Aristotle, and so Maimonides, um, with his teleological reasoning, explaining all by ways of design and intentionality, explaining things by reference, so-called final causes, uh, the ends, the goals, uh, the telos that are meant to be accomplished uh, by various changes that we see. Teleology is wildly irreconcilable with Spinoza. He utterly condemns teleology. This is really lies at the heart of Spinoza. Uh, so here, for example, um, he writes, thus the prejudice developed into superstition and took deep root in the human mind. And for this reason, everyone strove most zealously to understand and explain the final causes of things, to try to explain things by reference to what is accomplished, what is the end, the goal. Uh, but in their endeavor to show that nature does nothing in a vain, they only seem to have demonstrated that nature, the gods, and men are all mad together. Such a doctrine might well have sufficed to conceal the truth from the human race for all eternity if mathematics had not furnished another standard of verity without regard to final causes. And this is from uh, the ethics, uh, the first part, the appendix. In fact, if there is any ancient philosopher Spinoza, I think, should be compared to. It's not Aristotle. Uh, um, it's, it's Plato. Uh, that the fundamental intuitions about reality and the kind of explanations reality demands is, is, has an affinity with Plato uh, and, and Plato's emphasis on mathematics. And it just so happens that the thinkers of his immediate environment, Spinoza's immediate environment, who were immersed in Platonism and Neoplatonism, um, were, were the Kabbalists. Uh, in fact, it was very popular view uh, speculation that the, among them that the ancient Hebrews had uh, been granted this esoteric divine wisdom, and they had transmitted this esoteric wisdom uh, to other ancient thinkers, particularly Plato. Um, so that made Plato kosher, right? Because he really got it from, uh, from the ancient Hebrews. And, and, and this was a very popular idea in Spinoza's uh, Amsterdam, Jewish Amsterdam. So if we are determined to connect Spinoza's thinking with any traditional Jewish thinking, I think it ought to be Kabbalism. Um, and if I'm going to boldly, if insufficiently, uh, try to do so today. Okay, so those are my three audacious, bold claims. Um, okay, so the first claim, if you remember, concerns the audacity of Einstein's physics. Uh, when Einstein's theory of general relativity was published in 1915, uh, it not only challenged the reigning Newtonian paradigm of space and time and gravitation, uh, it not only subverted some of our deepest intuitions, proto-scientific uh, physical intuitions, what we call our folk physics about space and time and causality, um, it also was based on scant empirical evidence. 
The only available empirical evidence was that the theory correctly accounted for the anomalous procession of the perihelion, perihelion, perihelion of Mercury um, as, as the closest planet to the sun Mercury orbits a region of the solar system where space-time is, at least according to general relativity, disturbed or distorted by the sun's mass. This is a core idea in the theory of general relativity that the geometry of space-time is warped by large masses. Mercury's elliptical path uh, around the sun shifts slightly with each orbit so that its closest point to the sun, that's the perihelion, I've never said that word out loud, uh, only read it, shifts forward with each pass. Um, and the theory was published in 1915, and empirical validation of any kind didn't come until 1919, when the English physicists, Arthur Eddington, shown there with Einstein, together with his collaborators, were able to use a total solar eclipse to test a prediction of general relativity, uh, namely the precise angle at which light would be deflected near a massive body like the sun. General relativity asserts that gravity doesn't work the way Newton's law of universal gravitation uh, says it does, that two bodies will attract each other proportionally to the, uh, to the product of their two masses and inversely proportional to the distance between them. Though it's very, very hard to detect deviations from Newton's universal law. Rather, what general relativity audaciously says is that a massive body will warp the geometry of space-time so that the path of traveling light will bend near a massive body like the sun. Um, where is my picture? So hoping to prove Einstein's theory, try to garner some empirical evidence for it, Eddington and his collaborators traveled to the coast of West Africa in 1919 and photographed a total solar eclipse that was taking place there. And when they examined the photos, they were able to see the stars near the sun that are usually invisible. And seeing these stars, they could confirm that the sun's gravity had deflected the light 1.7 arc seconds which is exactly what's predicted by general relativity. Uh, the, the predictions were astonishing. They, they were accurate uh, to an astonishing degree. Uh, really appear that gravity does warp the geometry of space-time the way a bowling ball poised on some tautly stretched rope netting will change its geometry, a major, this is a major conceptual revolution. And general relativity is just a beautiful theory, and it's so internally coherent. Its math is beautiful, um, and it's just all so of a piece, logically welded together, just, just as a good Spinozist would have it, that it all either stands or falls together, which is a very unusual theory um, in that regard, and also unusual in that it was the work of one mind, right? That's very unusual uh, in, in science, right? Which is it's usually collaborative. I mean, think about, compare it to quantum mechanics, which had many, many uh, different minds working on it. This just came all of one, out of one mind, um, so that it really, you know, it's, it's sort of, uh, in that regard, more like a, a work of art, like a literary work, you know, as, as a sort of coming out of uh, one <coughs> mind. Um, one author. Um, and this explains something of the great celebrity that Einstein was suddenly thrust into after the 1919 solar eclipse. Um, to quote the physicist Paul Davies, 
Uh, what makes general relativity distinctive is that it treats gravitation not as a force between bodies, such as the sun and the earth, but as a warping or distortion in the geometry of space and time. This huge conceptual reorientation, plus the sheer mathematical beauty of the theory, ensured that general relativity acquired both a mystique and a fearsome reputation for impenetrability that made Einstein a byword for genius. Um, so the, the empirical confirmation, uh, such as it was, of Einstein's general theory was considered spectacular news. There was a special meeting of the Royal Society of Science in London to announce the discovery, and it made the front page of most major newspapers. Um, here's my favorite headline. There are lots of headlines. Lights all askew in the heavens. Men of science more or less, a, more or less a cog over results of eclipse observations. Einstein's theory triumphed. Stars not where they seemed or were calculated to be, but nobody need worry. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, it was, you know, it was, it was a, a real phenomenon. And he went on to travel the world lecturing on his theories, both special and general relativity. Um, and according to Einstein's biographer, Walter Isaacson, in the six years after the 1919 eclipse, more than 600 books and articles were written about his theories of the cosmos. Um, when he was asked by his assistant what his reaction would have been uh, if general relativity had not been confirmed by Eddington's experiments or observations of the solar eclipse, Einstein famously Quip, then I would feel sorry for the dear Lord. The theory is correct anyway. I mean, this is, cons this is confidence. Um, he was 40 years old, and his name became the synonymous, the eponym uh, for genius, as in, you know, he's no Einstein. And reportedly, Einstein once said, I'm no Einstein. <laughs> Having attained the reputation of a kind of 20th century um, Delphic oracle. He was plied uh, with questions, including about his religious beliefs. He often used God language, um, speaking of the dear Lord, or more often, the Alta, the old one. But not much should be inferred from this kind of talk. Physicists and mathematicians play very fast and loose uh, with God talk, even when they're confirmed atheists, uh, playfully using such language to, to, to suggest ultimate objectivity of a kind to which we mere humans may not be privy, at least not now and maybe not forever. Um, and in fact, whenever he was asked outright for his opinion about God, Einstein always resorted to Spinoza, responding that he believed in no God but Spinoza's. So for example, the noted Orthodox Jewish rabbi, uh, whose name I always remember, it was Herbert Goldstein of New York, no, no relation, Goldstein is an ex-husband's name anyway, so um, of New York City, um, hearing some, uh, once you publish under a name, you can never lose it. Um, but hearing some uh, disturbing reports of Einstein's decidedly <coughs> unorthodox religious views telegraphed the physicists in Berlin. Um, do you believe in God? Stop. Answer paid. 50 words. So the, the rabbi, Rabbi Goldstein, could actually have saved himself some money because Einstein used far fewer words than the prepaid 50. Um, what he answered was, I believe in Spinoza's God, who reveals himself in the lawful harmony of all that exists, but not in a God who concerns himself with the fate and doings of mankind. Um, I think that's all, yes. Um, it became the most famous version of an answer that he often gave to this particular question, always invoking Spinoza. And this brings me to the second of my claims. Einstein, I've already audaciously claimed, had 
such a strong metaphysical intuition as to the nature of reality that it empowered him to formulate a radical revision of space and time and gravity even when there was precious little empirical evidence to support his view. Um, my second claim is that the metaphysical intuition that lay so near the heart of Einstein's creative work in physics was one that the 20th century empirical physicists shared with the 17th century uber-rationalist philosopher. Yeah. So Spinoza lived as the project of modern mathematical physics was just getting off of the ground. And he was dead at the age of 44 before the major Newtonian paradigm was even proposed, the very paradigm uh, that Einstein in the early years of the 20th century would overturn. Spinoza died in 1677. Newton's Principia Mathematica was published in 1687, a decade later. So that Einstein would have shared with Spinoza an intuition that helped the physicist to produce his extraordinary physics is all the more remarkable. And remarkable, too, because Spinoza's thinking is so radically anti-empirical. He, I said he's the uber-rationalist of all time. He's made every claim for pure a priori reason of the kind that we use in mathematics, uh, bypassing empirical data. He made every claim for pure a priori reason that has ever been made. He claimed that pure reason can yield us the structure of the world. Not everything about the world, but the fundamental structure of the world, uh, demonstrating it to be quite contrary to what it seems to us by way of our experience. And that pure, even our most intimate experience, even our experience of ourselves. And that pure a priori reason can also dictate to us how we ought to live, right? After all, his magnum opus is called the ethics. Um, and here is uh, the first two pages of the ethics, because as you can see, it is written quite eccentrically. Probably many of you are familiar with it, um, but it's those of you who aren't, it's written in a priori reasons, most favored mode, uh, strictly formal deductive proofs, beginning with definitions and axioms and proceeding on uh, to propositions, which then serve as axioms and the further proofs, um, treating all of these propositions just trying to describe the nature of the world, the nature of our minds, uh, the nature of ourselves, and our, what our lives ought to be about, as if they were theorems of geometry. Um, but later on, in a rather offhand comment in the um, ethics, uh, he, he, he makes a, what to me seems a very poetic statement. Uh, it's my favorite statement in all of the ethics. He writes, for the eyes of the mind whereby it sees things and understands are none other than proofs. So this is a work that not only predates the major paradigm of modern uh, physics, Newton's Principia Mathematica, but which also seems to fly in the face of the entire scientific enterprise, which no matter how much mathematics uh, it uses, and physics uses obviously quite a lot, um, it, it is nonetheless an empirical science. Uh, empirical predictions are made and have to be con confirmed. Um, so this makes Spin Spinoza's influence on Einstein all the more remarkable. Spinoza, I should just mention, was wrong about his system being purely a priori a priori work that he believed it to be. Um, a priori pr uh, proposi uh, propositions, empiricists like me believe in any case, have no substantive uh, descriptive content. They are basically tautologies. In order to get descriptive content out, you have to put some descriptive content in. 
And Spinoza does put descriptive content into a system by way of that substantive, non-tautological, metaphysical intuition I'm calling the saturation principle. You won't find the saturation principle, which I haven't, I haven't told you, building up suspense, I haven't told you what it is yet. You won't find it ever stated in his axioms or his definitions um, because he Rather, he uses it as if it's a veritable law of logic, like the law of non-contradiction, in the course of deducing his conclusions. OK, so what, at long last, is the saturation principle uh, of that? Why is it that this, how this very descriptive intuition about the nature of the world that Spinoza had and Einstein did as well? So perhaps the best way to approach it is with an anecdote that's told about William James, the great uh, philosopher and psychologist. Um, and I'm pretty sure it's an apocryphal story, but for our purposes, that doesn't matter. And I'll give you the written version, which I find slightly sexist. That's why I don't want to say it. I'd rather you read it. Um, and this comes from the uh, linguist J.R. Ross. Um, after a lecture on cosmology and the structure of the solar system, William James was accosted by a little old lady. It's always a little old lady, isn't it? Saying something stupid. Your theory that the sun is the center of the solar system and the earth is a ball which rotates around it has a very convincing ring to it, Mr. James, but it's wrong. I've got a better theory. And what is that, madam, inquired James politely, that we live on a crust of earth which is on the back of a giant turtle. Not wanting to demolish this absurd little theory by bringing to bear the masses of scientific evidence he had at his command, James decided to gently dissuade his opponent by making her see some of the inadequacies of her position. If your theory is correct, madam, he asked, what does the turtle stand on? You're a very clever man, Mr. James, and that's a very good question, but I have an answer to it, and it is this. The first turtle stands on the back of a second far larger turtle who stands directly under it. But what does this second turtle stand on, persisted James patiently. To this, the little old lady crowed triumphantly. It's no use, Mr. James. It's turtles all the way down. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, and this is from this book, um, Constraints on Variabilities in Syntax, published in 19. 67, so what the saturation principle asserts is that the little old lady was kind of right because it is something all the way down. Though it isn't turtles, she got that wrong. This is a, can you read this? It's really, <laughs> yeah, there's an orifice right there. Okay, good, you can read it. Um, what it is all the way down is reasons. Underneath every reason stands another reason, and under that reason, another, and so on ad infinitum. And beneath the whole series of infinite reasons, there is, of course, a reason. It has to be this very infinite series and no other. This is what the saturation principle asserts. That reality, the whole kit and caboodle of it, is saturated, saturation principle, through and through with reasons. There is nothing arbitrary, inexplicable, unnecessitated, no brute contingency, no fact which is a fact for no other reason than that it happens to be a fact. There are no unsightly threads dangling out from the fabric of reality. And that applies to the whole of reality itself. It, <coughs> reality, must account for everything, including itself. That it exists at all. That there is something rather than nothing. And that it exists precisely in the way that it exists. Um, all must be explicable by way of reasons that refer to nothing over and beyond reality itself. In Spinoza's language, reality is casa sui, is the cause of itself. It's the explanation of itself, which we, in our finitude, whatever it is, this completeness, uh, the, this implicate order, uh, whatever it is, is infinite. And we, in our finitude, 
can't possibly penetrate it all. We, our minds can't encompass it. Um, yeah, there's a kind of incompleteness theorem that comes out of uh, Spinoza's ethics. Um, but if we were to fully understand it, we would understand that it must be such, this infinite infinity, as to generate its own existence. If the saturation principle is to be satisfied, which he just took to be a kind of law of logic, the violation of the saturation principle was to him like the violation of the law of non-contradiction. It just is a violence to our reasoning capacity. Um, this means that according to Spinoza, the world is determined by logic itself, um, at least if we regard the saturation principle as itself a logical principle, which it isn't. It's not on the same par with the law of non-contradiction. Um, I tried to get a picture for the saturation principle. Uh, that's the best I came up with. But if you've got anything, if you find anything better, please send me. Um, in any case, whether or not it's a law of logic, the saturation principle is what, in Spinoza's system, puts the ontos, being, gives us the word ontological, uh, into the logos. And the ontos that he derives is of, of an infinite implicate order in which all is bound together by necessary connections because of its reasons all the way down, then these reasons must ultimately be necessary. Otherwise, contingency, ugly, arbitrary contingency will seep in. Um, and here are some further. So this is, this is what gets the whole system going. This is what, as I say, puts the ontos into the logos. And here are some further consequences that are drawn from the extraordinarily potent presumption of the saturation principle. To be is to be explicable. To be is either to be identical with the whole infinite web of an implicate order or to be implicated by it. The ways we have of trying to conceive of the infinite web of the implicate order are severely limited we have only two ways of conceiving of it, by way of the attribute of extension and by way of the attribute of thought. But, but it's actually, um, it could be expressed in infinite ways, but of course our finite minds can only think of two. So two is an arbitrary number. Um, it can't be, you know, with Spinoza there are only, either there's one or there's infinite. There can't be anything in between because that makes it arbitrary. So the two uh, that are the two attributes of our, by, by which, means of which we try to explain things um, and make sense of our experience is simply a measure of our own finitude. Um, Spinoza, let's see, is there anything else? Yeah, were we capable of grasping the whole infinite web of an implicate order, which we are being finite, necessarily incapable of doing, then we would grasp the explanation for all and grasping them, see how all is necessary. The appearance of the arbitrary, the contingent, the undetermined is merely the measure of our own pathetic finitude of our incomplete and incompletable knowledge. So Spinoza calls this ontos, uh, the infinite, by various names. He calls it substance, um, usurping the term that Aristotle had introduced to serve as the linchpins of his own ontology. Um, but since Spinoza's ontology is entirely different, he radically deforms what Spinoza means by substance, causing so much confusion to this day among philosophers. He calls it nature, though of course he doesn't mean by nature, you know, bubbling brooks or poetic sunsets. Um, he also calls it God, subverting the conventional meaning of that term even more radically than he subverts the Aristotelian notion of substance or the common meaning of nature. Um, it is, a, it of course follows from his notion of God, the one infinite implicate order that itself exhausts all reasons so that nothing can possibly exist outside of it, that this precludes the existence of, um, of the Abrahamic God, which has some kind of will, who makes choices and acts on his choices, uh, choosing what the that the universe should exist, you know, let it be, and the laws of nature by which it exists, not to speak of the ethical and religious laws by which we ought to exist. All appeals to the will of God constitute 
violations of the saturation principle. Right? There can be nothing outside of substance, also known as God, also known as nature. Uh, Einstein didn't regard the saturation principle as on a par with a veritable law of nature, as Spinoza did. He understood very, very well that it is logically possible that it not be satisfied and that our world indeed may violate it. But his strong intuition was that it is satisfied, that it is reasons all the way down. And this was the intuition he brought to bear in his physics. I'm, I, I've got a lot of quotes from him about his physics, um, showing how much he hated the notion of anything arbitrary in both special relativity. I'll give you just the one in, in uh, uh, it, it was already present in, in forming uh, a special relativity, his distaste for anything arbitrary, contingent. But his, his Spinoza's intuition uh, became even stronger uh, after he um, was able to eliminate, uh, where is that? Uh, uh, the cosmological constant that it presented itself itself to him as, I think he called it a renunciation of the logical simplicity of the theory by which he meant the expulsion of arbitrary um, elements. I have lots of quotes about this, but I'm just going to give you one here. Um, Since I have introduced this lambda term, I have always had a bad conscience. But at that time, I could see no other possibility to deal with the fact of the existence of a finite mean density of matter. I found it very ugly indeed but the field, that the field law of gravitation should be composed of two logically independent terms, which are connected by addition. About the justification of such feelings concerning logical simplicity, it is difficult to argue. I cannot help to feel it strongly. And I am unable to believe that such an ugly thing should be realized in nature. And this was in a letter he wrote to a colleague, Lemaitre. Um, Einstein's intuitions, uh, Spinoza's intuitions, that there's nothing arbitrary in nature, not only shaped the details of his theories, but it determined the kinds of questions he asked of the universe, the kinds of questions he thought the universe was capable of answering, which is different from the assertion that we are capable of answering them. Um, this is from uh, Stephen Hawking's A Brief History of Time. Einstein once asked the question, how much choice did God have in constructing the universe? Even if there is only one possible unified theory, it is just a set of rules and equations. What is it that breathes fire into the equations and makes a universe for them to describe? Why does the universe go to the father of existing? Is the unified theory so compelling that it brings about oh. its own existence. Like Spinoza, Einstein was convinced that ultimately the universe, and nothing but the universe, nature, held the answers to these questions. And he was also of the opinion, as Spinoza was, that our capacities weren't up to the task of attaining those answers, but that to accept this limitation while simultaneously striving always to increase our knowledge wasn't a tragic, a deplorable, a grievous situation, but in fact, an expansively joyous and redemptive one. Following the lead of Spinoza, Einstein ident identified as a religious emotion, our simultaneously understanding that the universe is replete, saturated with reasons, while only some small subset of them are apprehendable by us. It's reasons all the way down, but we will never see all the way down. But we can trust that it goes all the way down. Um, but that, for Einstein, as for Spinoza, is no cause for despair, and quite, in fact, quite the opposite. The most beautiful, this is Spinoza, uh, Einstein, the most beautiful emotion we can experience is the mysterious, to sense that behind anything that can be experienced. There is something that our minds cannot grasp, whose beauty and sublimity reaches us only indirectly. This is religiousness. In this sense, and in this sense only, I am a devoutly religious man. Spinoza, too, had argued that this, his conception of God, this feeling of reverential awe that it ought to inspire in us, 
what he had called amor de intellectualis, the intellectual love of God, was truly religious, was true piety, piety that, that, that's consistent with the nature of reality. Um, we know what his scandalized, Spinoza's scandalized uh, contemporaries thought of his claim, and after he was put into harem by his community, it fell on greater Christian Europe uh, to excoriate him, declaring him to be Satan's emissary on earth, right into the next century's Age of Enlightenment and beyond. But even Einstein had to defend his chosen sense of religiosity that he claimed for himself uh, following um, Spinoza. I can understand your aversion to the use of the term religion to describe an emotional and psychological attitude which shows itself most clearly in Spinoza. But I have not found a better expression than religious for the trust in the rational nature of reality, the saturation principle, right? That is, at least to a certain extent, accessible to human reason. And once more, just I love these quotes from him. Um, the human mind, no matter how highly trained, cannot grasp the universe. We are in the position of a little child entering a huge library whose walls are covered to the ceiling with books in many different languages. The child knows that someone must have written those books. It does not know who or how. It does not understand the language is in which they are written. The child notes a definite plan in the arrangement of the books, a mysterious order which it does not comprehend but only dimly understands. Lest you think that Einstein, in speaking of someone writing these books, is appealing to something like the conventional God, the Abrahamic God who exists outside of nature and acts with intentions, choosing the laws of nature, rather than Spinoza's God, um, then it seems to me, this Einstein again, it seems to me that the ideas of a personal God is an anthropological concept which I cannot take seriously. I feel also not able to imagine some will or goal outside the human sphere. My views are near those of Spinoza. Admiration for the beauty of and belief in the logical simplicity of the order which we can grasp humbly and only imperfectly. I believe that we have to consent ourselves with our imperfect knowledge and understanding and treat values and moral obligations as a purely human problem, the most important of all human problems. Um, and I think it goes further in the Spinoza's direction in, in drawing these ethical implications. In 1950, a grieving father, having just lost his young child to polio, wrote to Einstein to ask for some kind of uh, solace, some kind of consolation. That's the kind of position that Einstein played in the culture of that day. And Einstein wrote back to the father in terms that are utterly Spinozistic, de demonstrating how far he was willing to go in following Spinoza's spiritual and ethical deductions regarding our human situation in such a universe as Spinoza um, had described, and how we might, given our situation, cope with the tragic dimension, at least from the human point of view, it seems like, the tragic dimension of that universe. Um, Einstein's rigorously Spinozist answer to this grieving father is really extraordinary. Um, here's a picture of it. You can see he, uh, it's this working draft. You can see how he really labored over to compose it. And he first, um, he worked out his thoughts in German, and then he translated them into English, and then he had his sep secretary type it out. Um, uh, and it says, a human being is a part of the whole called by us universe, a part limited in time and space. No no experiences himself, his thoughts and feelings, as something separate from the rest, a kind of optimal, op, op, optional, op, optical. optical, sorry, it's very hard to read this, delusion of his consciousness. The striving to free oneself from this delusion is the one issue of true religion. Not to nourish the delusion, but to try to overcome it is the way to reach the attainable measure of peace of mine, with my best wishes, sincerely yours, Albert Einstein. I don't know, I don't know how much consolation that poor father derived from this. Um, OK, so I've boldly claimed about Einstein's phys physics was 
generously fed by his metaphysical intuition, and that his metaphysical intuition, which I dubbed the saturation principle, was one that he shared with the uber-rationalist Spinoza. And I've also claimed that whether or not Einstein came by his metaphysical intuition independently of Spinoza, which I think he did, when it came to drawing the spiritual and ethical implications from it, he was deeply influenced by Spinoza, thus explaining the reverence, the love that, you know, that would inspire a, a love poem. Um, and uh, I come to my last of my claims, the most audacious, that the intuition that resonated so deeply in Einstein finding expression not only in his physics, but in his spiritual and ethical outlook, had been suggested to Spinoza, whether consciously or unconsciously, by the Kabbalism that was being pursued by many in his community, including some of the teachers that he had had in the Talmud Torah school that he had attended, the only formal education he ever had. Um, how was it that he came to his fundamental intuition that reality consists of an infinity that holds within itself an explosively gener generative power, uh, a coiled up necessity that can't be contained, just explodes into existence, yielding an infinity of cons consequences, more than our feeble minds can conceive of, making it the imminent and indwelling cause of everything, including each of us whose failings, intellectual, psychological, ethical, all have their source in our finitude, including our excessively finite knowledge, necessarily incomplete, though not so necessarily incomplete as what we tolerate in ourselves, so that the work of repairing ourselves and our world of human relations, which is the proper subject of ethics, rests in expanding our knowledge, trying to replicate the infinite order that is reality as much as we can within our own minds, and that is freedom for him. From what could such intuitions about the vast consequence of the infinite have derived? And Ain't so, right? Those Hebrew letters spell out, of course, ain't so, lit literally without N, the Hebrew for infinite, the infinite infinity, uh, which in Lorianic Kabbalah designates the hidden core of God's being, which we can never completely penetrate. We can never, our minds can never encompass because it's infinite. The ain't so emanates in the sephirot, the manifestations uh, of the ain't so that constitute the visible universe. If I had more time, you could, you could, I could perhaps explicate the very confusing uh, relationship between Spinoza's notions of natura naturans and natura naturata, nature, naturing and nature natured, uh, from the relationship between the Ain't Sof and the Sephirot. Uh, we know that Spinoza kept abreast of these ideas. Uh, there were several Kabbalist books in his personal library at the time that he died. And he actually tells us in the Tractatus Theological Politicus that he was, had personally known several Kabbalists, though actually his words there don't lend too much support to my claim of a Kabbalist influence on Spinoza to wit. I have also read, and for that matter, personally known some Kabbalist triflers. I've never been able to be sufficiently amazed by their madness. <laughs> but. That's not the only thing he ever says in a letter to Henry Oldenburg, who was a secretary of the newly established Royal Society in London and a very frequent correspondent with Spinoza. Spinoza makes a remark that might be interpreted as an oblique homage to Kabbalism. In that letter, Spinoza is addressing Oldenburg's somewhat scandalous reaction to Spinoza's identification of God with nature. I favor an opinion concerning God and nature far different from the modern Christians usually defend. For I maintain that God is, as they say, the imminent, but not the transitive cause of all things, that all things are in God and move in God. I affirm, I say with Paul, and perhaps with all the ancient philosophers, I would also be so bold as to say with the ancient Hebrews, as far as we can co conjecture from certain received traditions, corrupted as they have been in many ways. Received traditions is what Kabbalah, that's, that's the translation of Kabbalah. I'm not alone <laughs> among scholars in thinking that Spinoza's reference to certain received traditions in this letter is a reference to Kabbalah. Um, 
And in suggesting that his view was shared by all the ancient philosophers, Spinoza is endorsing this opinion that was very current in his uh, in Jewish Amsterdam, namely that there had been an ancient divine, divine wisdom first grasped by the ancient Hebrews and transmitted through them to other ancient philosophers, most especially to Plato, but that it had become so corrupted by established religions as to require fresh revelation from the Kabbalists of of, of Spain, uh, who after the expulsion of 1492 scattered some to the Holy Land, especially to Sfat or to Constantinople, many to Portugal, and then eventually to Amsterdam. Um, it's getting late, but there was one, there's a book that has only recently been translated from the Portuguese uh, by Abraham Cohen de Herrera, um, and the book is Puerta de Ciela, The Gate of, Hell of Heaven. Um, and uh, where is it? There it is. Uh, we don't know where Herrera came from. Uh, some people think he came from Florence, but he showed up in Amsterdam, and he had a tremendous influence on Amsterdam, Amsterdam's Sephardic community because of his deep knowledge of Kabbalah. It was actually from him that uh, Rabbi Isaac de Pasenka, the chief rabbi of the Sephardic community, received his instructions in Kabbalah. There are stunning parallels uh, to be found in Gates of Heaven with Spinoza's philosophy, most stunningly between Spinoza's conception of this generative power of, of the infinite. Uh, for Herrera, the Ein Sof entails maximal potency. It's an infinity that activates everything that is possible. Um, I've got lots of quotes so, giving the parallels here. Um, in Spinoza, these ideas about generative capacities of the infinite generated consequences inimical to even the most philosophical, that it generated in Spinoza consequences that are inimical to even the most philosophical of Lorianic Kabbalists, such as Harara. For even Harara, I found in reading the book, describes the tzimtzum, the self-contraction of God that made room for the emergence of the visible world that is so fundamental in Lorianic Kabbalism as an act of conscious, deliberate will on the part of God. And this is irreconcilable with Spinoza's universe, not in Spinoza's universe. Um, this attribution to God of a, of a human type of will bring, brings down for Spinoza the whole mad logic of teleology uh, that would subvert uh, the self-contained necessity of the universe. And that might have made Spinoza even uh, categorize Herrera as a Kabbalist trifler for not carrying through to what Spinoza saw as the logical conclusion of the generative capacity of the infinite. But that's still consistent with the original conception of such a generative conception of the infinite having been implanted in Spinoza by what he heard and read of the Kabbalists uh, in Amsterdam. And that, hence my third and most ill-argued uh, claim tonight that the most heretic, most famous heretical Jewish son, maybe Marx is even more famous and heretical, but one of the most heretical uh, Jewish sons who put into permanent harem at the age of 24 so that nobody in his community, not anybody of his family, um, was ever permitted to exchange a word with him was only taking certain esoteric Jewish ideas that had captured his own community and carrying them forth boldly, audaciously, fearlessly to whatever startling conclusions they seemed to yield to him. And from his having done so, so many other startling consequences followed. I think the entire European Enlightenment, in fact, followed 100 years later uh, from what Spinoza had done. Um, but, oh, yeah, I worked so hard to get that. Yeah, <laughs> including one of, the, one of the consequences that the most celebrated physicists of the modern age 
uh, was so deeply touched by the conclusions of this uber-rationalist system as to write a love poem to Spinoza's epics. So anyway, that's it. Thanks. <laughs> So we, please raise your hand if you have a question, and we will bring the microphone to you. Thank you so much for your talk. I, I say uh, what I'm about to say is with, with full uh, compliment uh, because everything was so lucid. It was almost like uh, Spinoza for dummies. <laughs> but uh, um, uh, my questions are two. Number one, if everything derives from reason, uh, does that create a deterministic world? Mm -hmm. Number two, the answer is yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. And number two, how is it po does does this notion of the uh, saturation principle uh, saturate individual lives? Because uh, because it seems to me that. Uh, individual life is saturated with contingencies. Uh, so how do you reckon, I, I can understand the universe at large, but those are my questions, thank yeah. you. And they're, <laughs> and they're very, very good questions. Um, yes, I mean, Spinoza's is a strongly determinist uh, system. Um, everything is ultimately re you know, reduced to logic. If, there's a, if it's reasons all the way down, um, it's, there's always a reason why. Um, and yet, um, the ethics is, is, a, is a, a work that tries to change us, right? And, and, it, and it actually did. It, it had tremendous consequences, historical consequences. Um, and so it's, it's not a fatalist system, even though determinist system. Um, and the way that we can change um, is we can, we can change our ideas. We will, that will be de determined. He's trying to determine us. He's trying to necessarily determine us to change our ideas, right? So by writing a book like this, and we read this book, we study it, we understand it, we, we become convinced, you know, we change our, our, our ideas. Um, and, and and all sorts of ideas will change as a consequence, including, and this I think gets to your second question, and to, including our notions of ourself, um, that we are just clusters, finite clusters, of the infinite ideas of, of God, or this, of this infinite uh, implicate order. Um, and, and, and so the sort of the belief in our, uh, in the inviolability, the certainty of our, of our identity, of our self-identity, that shrivels away too. That we're, our commitment, in fact, to our own selves shrivels away to a certain extent. Uh, the more we identify with that thing which is substance, reality, God, nature. And so that he even offers us at the end, and so our emotions change. That's one of the things that he promises us, that uh, by seeing how we are part of this thing and also seeing how our reactions to things are determined, all of the painful emotions will disappear. Um, so anger, hatred, resentment, um, you know, to see that everything is, is, is necessary is to, for all of these uh, ide uh, emotional reactions to be dissolved. Um, and, um, and, all that we, and all that we experience is the joy of understanding and this ultimate joy, um, amor de intellectualis, the, the intellectual love of God, you know, this appreciation of having uh, been implicated derived from this one system. So he even offers us a kind of cold consolation, and that's what Einstein was echoing there uh, in his letter to the grieving father, uh, for you know, our own mortality, which is part of our finitude, um, and, and the mortality of those whom we love. You know, we, the kind of consolation is, gee whiz, 
you know, we were implicated for however short a period of time, uh, and that implication will always be true, right? It will always necessarily be true that we will have existed, uh, that we had once existed. Um, and that's all the consolation that we can derive uh, about our mortality and ourselves, um, which is consistent with the true nature of reality. Um, and, um, you know, and it kind of works, actually. The, you, the more you read it, the more uh, you can get into this transcendent state. Um, it's not very good for raising children. Um, the Spinoza's transcendent state, but uh, um, Spinoza didn't have children, <laughs> perhaps wisely. Yes. Um, Hi, Marty. I didn't hello. see you there. <laughs> um, comment on um, evolutionary psychology and the rationalist program. Um, by what miracle could it be that a faculty that's only been shaped by reproductive edge and survival could possibly penetrate the reality of the universe. How is it that we can do physics and we can, when we can only do psychology? Yeah, so of course, you know, Einstein, I'm Einstein, Spinoza would love this question, I think, you know, that it is in fact, you know, that we, we have been shaped, first of all, well, in some sense he would love it. Evolution, uh, the theory of evolution, and it's, uh, it's uh, um, stretching into evolutionary psychology, um, seems to uh, recognize the merely contingent, the you know, accidents of, of nature that happened and, you know, and, um, and, you know, he wouldn't accept that. He would say it's an incomplete theory. If we really saw theory, you know, saw reasons all the way down, we would see that all of these things, in fact, had to happen. So evolutionary, uh, Darwinian evolution, evolutionary psychology, since it so recognizes, it so um, prioritizes the contingent, would not go down well with, with Spinoza or with Einstein. Um, however, the fact that um, the second part of it, that we have, it, it's endowed us with these, you know, very finite ways of explaining the universe. Uh, it's consistent with, with, uh, with what they would say. But yeah, I mean, this trying to reconcile uh, evolutionary theory with, with, with Spinoza's view of things is, is, seems not necessary. All the such a person would say. And there were people around. In fact, a lot of string theorists. My, my best audience for talking about Spinoza is always string theorists, right? Because they think it's reason. Max Tegmark, for example, it's, it's math. It's reasons all the way down. It's basically a priori uh, reason. Um, we can't see it, but that's just because our minds are, are finite. Um, for our minds to be infinite, they would have to be uh, congruent with, with God, nature, substance. So not a very good answer, but that's the best I can do. <laughs> Thanks. Um, so it's sort of, it's hard to think about Einstein you know, opening up a book of the ethics and saying, oh yes, you know, definition is six P, it's an entry, it's an entry new, and yes, proposition 42, it's all of this, proposition 43, and 39. Yeah, so his son-in-law was, in fact, a Spinoza scholar um, and had written a book on, um, on Spinoza. Um, and I think, you know, that this, it seems to me that there really is evidence of his having uh, grappled uh, with, the, with the ethics. 
um, he, he very much understood what the basic fundamental metaphysical intuition was. Uh, that is reasons all the way down. And that's one that he, I don't think he derived it from there. I think that it came just as, it became naturally uh, to him. Um, but that in having uh, seen it, maybe having spoken to his son-in-law uh, and being, you know, uh, apprised of the fact that, that this is what makes the system work, um, yeah, I think he actually really studied it. And when you really see it coming out is, for example, I think in that letter uh, to the father of the, of the grieving father, right, that he had followed the implications of the, of the ethics to this very radical conclusion uh, that the, the self kind of, if we really follow uh, the reasoning out, the self kind of... Um, that firm grasp we have of ourselves and our commitment to ourselves uh, somehow unravels in such and simply the apprehension of the whole. And, and there, I think, you know, in his uh, spiritual and ethical conclusions, there's evidence of his really uh, having uh, studied Spinoza. And that would explain, you know, this profound reverence, uh, you know, a holy halo, nobody, you know, on his, around his head. So I, I don't think it's just the, oh, you know, a heretic like me, uh, one of a kind sort of thing. I think Spinoza must have changed his views about certain things. You don't have in a person like Einstein that kind of reverential gratitude unless your views were taken further. That's my audacious claim. <laughs> Thank you. It was a wonderful lecture. I have a question. If pure reason is a priori, which I think I believe it is, then why would knowledge be beyond the limits of reason? Yeah. Um, because there can be implications, infinite number of implications, that we can't get to, uh, being finite. Uh, I mean, that's a situation we have um, even in mathematics, right? There are conjectures uh, that we think are true. Uh, Goldbach's conjecture, for example, that every even number is the sum of two primes. Um, Every, we've checked it out, every even number, that turns out to be the sum of two primes, but we can't keep going ad infinitum. Um, and perhaps a proof that we just doesn't exist that we can get to. Perhaps it's true. If it's false, then we could discover it, because there's a counterexample. Um, so if Goldbach's conjecture that every even number is the sum of two primes is, is false, then in principle we could discover it. But it might be true, and we can never no, it's true, because we just have to go on and keep checking every number, um, and that no proof actually exists. So that's the kind of thing. D does that satisfy you at all? Um, well, I feel as though the, we, with reason and more knowledge that we accumulate every single day and year, right. eventually we'll, we would be able to to have all the answers. Yeah. Now you can go on for many, 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 many years, forever, but you can, you constantly get to more knowledge through reason. Yeah. And that's where I find the contradiction. And and that's what he tells us we ought to do. And therein lies our freedom, okay. right? Um, also a very Jewish idea, right? That to the extent that we understand, um, we are um, we make spiritual. Uh, advances and become better and freer. Um, so we ought to be doing that. Uh, but if, in fact, reality is reasons all the way down and it's and, and it's and it's uh, uh, and it's infinite, we may not be able to ever get to it all. Not even such a 
paltry little isolated truth is Goldbach's conjecture that every even number is the sum of two primes. That may lie beyond us. How much more so uh, to get to the very bottom and understand why it had to be this universe and no other universe. But he promises us that the universe, were we to know it in its entirety, would yield that answer. But we can't. Um, and that's the human situation, but it's not one to uh, grieve about, but rather to, uh, to rejoice in. Thank you. One last question. Okay. I kind of liked ending with that poetic sense, but <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. uh, that's a good ending. Why don't we end there? Okay. <laughs>